Welcome to all the participants. You have joined in with us for Shastra monthly webinar series. Before I offer warm welcome to our today's guest, I would like to tell you all a bit about Shastra Snehi. Shastra Snehi is a platform, a community of science enthusiasts where people from various backgrounds and parts of the country come together with the sole purpose, that is to make science enthralling for all. Now, my dear friends, with great pleasure, I would like to welcome our today's speaker, Dr. Hia Ghosh. She has received her doctoral degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, USA. She later joined Columbia University Medical Center, New York for her postdoctoral studies, where she focused on the transcriptional regulation of immune cell development. After finishing her postdoctoral studies, she spent a brief tenure in neuroscience department at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York. There, her work focused on two diverse areas of research. Under Professor Jean Hubbard, she researched on cortical neuron regeneration and signaling pathways in adult neurogenesis. She is currently working as a faculty in NCBS National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, which is a part of TIFR. Here she uses her interdisciplinary experience in molecular biology, humanology, and neuroscience to understand some fundamental cellular processes in the adult brain from the morphological and neuroimmune perspective. Her lab is interested in understanding the genetic control of cellular processes. This underlie normal brain function using mouse as a model system. Her group investigates molecular regulation of neuronal, glial and stem cells of the adult mammalian brain. Her studies contributed significantly to the understanding of plasma cytoid dendritic cell development and maintenance. During her postdoctoral studies, she was awarded the prestigious scholar award from the American Society of Hematology for her investigation in PDC biology. And my dear friends, she is also a Ramanujan fellow. We are thrilled to have you ma'am with us today. Without further ado, let me hand over to Dr. Hia Ghosh for today's session. Thank you, Asta. Is the audio, it's echoing for me, is it all right? For everyone? No, it's fine, ma'am. All right. So thank you so much for inviting me for this webinar series and I'm thrilled uh, to know that this is mainly organized by students and uh, and we get a chance to discuss some biology, especially about the brain and the stem cells. So without further delay, let me take you to my slides. All right, so um, as you guys know, today we are going to talk about neural stem cells and the process of neurogenesis. And so to begin with, if I told you that running or physical exercise, aerobic exercise, um, that pumps up your heart rate, makes you sweat, actually has benefits to improve cognition, that is to do with learning and memory. It also has something to do with improving your mood, that is to do with the emotional function of the brain. And in fact, it also helps protect your brain cells in the long run. And all of this has something to do with new neurons that are generated by stem cells that reside in the brain, in the adult brain and make neurons throughout the lifespan. And conversely, studies also show that situations that are more deprivated, like for example, social isolation or sedentary lifestyle, where you are not doing much physical activity and mostly by yourself, that can actually slow down your cognition that can also cause anxiety and depression and make your brain cells more vulnerable to diseases with aging, such as neurodegeneration. And all of this. Hello, ma'am. Uh, ma yes? uh, can you uh, stop sharing and screen uh, that one more time? Everything is fine, but uh, it's just a little problem with the screen sharing. That's it, nothing. Uh, should I stop sharing? Yeah, just stop sharing and uh, do share one more time. That's it. <clears throat> Okay, so let me know how much of it was uh, is to be said again, is to be repeated. Are you able to see now? Is the screen visible? Okay, uh, is ma'am, it's clear, perfect. 
All right. So I was talking about the impact of stem cells and the process of new neuron generation in the adult brain uh, in the context of things that elevate your memory functions and mood and protect your brain cells and conversely can actually reduce neurogenesis or reduction in this process can lead to an opposite effect where one can face emotional issues slowed down cognition, and in fact, the brain cells could get more vulnerable. Um, is there a problem with, the, okay, all right. So more than a hundred years back, Santiago Ramini Cajal, who is also known as the father of modern neuroscience, posited that in adult centers, the nerve path are something fixed and immutable. Everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. It is, it is for the science of the future to change, if possible, this harsh decree. And indeed, research in the last decades have proved these wrong. New neurons are indeed made in the, new, in the adult brain, and this is done from cells that are called neural stem cells that reside in the adult brain. So it's exciting news indeed that you have cells in the adult brain that can make cells of the brain. And these are neurons and a collection of other cell types that are called glia. So does that mean that the solution of neurodegeneration will finally be resolved because you have cells that can make new neurons? Or is there fun physiological function of these stem cells and these new born neurons in the healthy brain? And after all, is that all good news? So to understand this, we'll discuss today a little bit more about the nature of the stem cells and the process of adult neurogenesis. The first indications that new neurons could be found in adult brain came about six decades back through the work of Joseph Altman. So and in 1962, what he was intending to do in his experiment was to study glial proliferation. Now, unlike neurons, glia, the other cell types, which consist of astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, astrocytes in specific were known to undergo proliferation and make many more of them in response to injury, to respond to injury. And in order to study this process, uh, what Altman did was create a lesion in the retinogeniculate center of the brain, which is known as the relay center for visual cortex. So the neurons of the retinogeniculate center are the one that receive inputs from the retina and then relate it, relate it to the other parts of the brain, the visual cortex, allowing us to encode for what we are seeing. And in this process, in the process of uh, while doing this lesion in the retinogeniculate area, he also infused something else. He infused precursors of DNA. Now, most of us know that DNA is made up of oligonucleotide bases of four types, A, T, G, C, and T stands for thymidine. And this is the nucleotide, the DNA precursor that was infused in that intracranial lesion process. And this nucleotide was further marked through um, further labeled, radio label, um, radio label so that it could be visualized later in the slices through autoradiography in brain slices. And after doing this experiment, he waited for several days and then took the brain slices to see what all types of cells incorporated this radionucleotide. Now, the, the expectations from this labeling process is that since you are infusing a DNA precursor, any cell that will divide would have to make DNA and in the process of DNA synthesis, it will incorporate this radio label nucleotide, which will then mark the cells to be one of the new cells that came upon after the infusion was put in. And therefore, any cell that would have a radio label would have to be a newborn cell in the brain. And when he was looking for these cells many days later after the infusion, he found that several of these cells were actually not glial cells, but in fact, they were neurons. So this was very striking and he quickly published the short letter showing that new neurons seem to be there in adult brain. But this was highly controversial, but he went on with his studies and performed, repeated this experiment in absence of a lesion just by infusing 
the radio label nucleotide this time systematically in the body instead of in the brain uh, through intraperitoneal injection and then looked for the presence of this nucleotide containing new cell in the brain and he saw that in the hippocampus specifically of the rodent brain he could find a lot of cells that did not look like glia but looked like neuron in the dentage iris area of the hippocampus at the time when this uh, studies were published it was highly controversial because uh, because of the long standing notion that no new neurons are ever born after birth but decades of research during that time ultimately led to detection of new neurons even in the adult human hippocampus and this was uh, work done about two decades or more later in fred gage's lab where they looked at post mortem tissue from cancer patients now brdu is is also a thymidine analog and you know decades have passed by now and so instead of radio labeling which is a little dangerous uh, now nucleotide could be chemically modified so that they could be detected later by immunochemical um, staining and brdu is one such modification of the thymidine and cancer patients are often given this brdu infusion to detect dividing cells as a cancer diagnostics so these patients after you know they had lived their lives uh, their post mortem tissues were analyzed for the presence of brdu in the brain and in fact that in the same location as found by altman in the rotten brain that is in the hippocampus and in the hippocampus the dentage iris area they could find brdu labeled neuron looking like cells in the granule cell layer of the dentage iris and in their experiment they went a step further and uh, labeled or immunohistochemically labeled these slices with a neuronal marker that was specific to granule mature granule neuron which are the neuron type present in the dentage iris and were able to say, show that the brdu labeled cell was indeed a neuronal cell and not a glial cell so this was the first time the first evidence that new neurons new mature neurons were found in human adult brain and this then started a whole lot of effort to investigate more about the stem cells more about the function of these new neurons that are formed and we have learned a lot in the last decades so a few things that are definitively known now is that adult neural stem cells are present in the adult brain of many vertebrates including human however these stem cells are not everywhere in the brain they are not in all locations of the brain they are located in very restricted locations um and to be specific they are found along the lateral ventricles of the ventricular uh, walls and in the hippocampus and to give you an idea of these technical terms that i just um said if this is a mouse uh, and you're looking inside its brain this is the snout and this is the back of the head um then you will see this hollow part these are the lateral ventricles and now if you make a cut from top to bottom which is called dorsoventrally then you can get a slice that looks like this and this hollow area is the lateral ventricle on both sides of the hemisphere and it is along the wall of this lateral ventricle do you find stem cells and this niche is called the subventricular zone the other area the other particular part of the brain where neural stem cells reside is in the hippocampus now if you go a little bit back caudally to the brain and make a slice there instead you get a slice that looks like this and you can see the hippocampal hippocampal formation beautifully here it looks like a butterfly and inside this hippocampal formation this structure is called the dentage iris and the very thin first two layers of these cell this is a pack of cell layers is the subgranular zone where stem cells reside in the hippocampus so pretty much two specific places in the adult brain the other thing that is known now is that although these are stem cells capable of making neurons and glia they are in fact restricted for the fate of the cells that they can make for example in rodents the only new only new type of neurons that are made are the interneurons of the olfactory bulb that has to do with the olfaction 
and the granule neurons of the hippocampus that has to do with hippocampus function. And consistently in humans also, the new neurons that are born are of specific types, that is the granule neuron in hippocampus, stridal interneuron, and off late, very recently, olfactory neurons have also been formed, found to be made in the adult human brain. And finally, but the most exciting part of understanding the process or finding out more about stem cells has been the realization that the stem cells residing deep inside the brain actually talk to the environment. How much neurons can they make or if or at all they will make a neuron or a glia can actually be dictated through their experiences. An enriched environment enhances adult neurogenesis, whereas a deprived environment decreases it. And consistently, it has also been shown that physical situations, physiological situations, which are thought to be uh, less than ideal, such as aging or inflammation, has also been shown to have an adverse effect on the process of adult neurogenesis. Now, before I go further uh, talking about the importance of adult neurogenesis or about stem cells, I think I'd like to give you a glimpse of how experimentally we gain understanding about the process in the cells. So in my previous slide, I showed you these cartoon. This is a cartoon which was a rostral section of the brain. And this is actual picture of a brain section uh, in which you can see the hippocampal formation, the cortex. And this, this picture can tell you the different regions of the brain, but it cannot tell you the cells and tell you the difference between tell a cell from being a glia or a neuron or a stem cell. But scientists are able to genetically manipulate uh, the system so that they can specifically look or perturb the cell type of their choice at the time of their choice too. And one such example would be the expression of green fluorescent protein in a cell specific manner. So these are sections of same kind from a rodent brain, except that this mouse is genetically modified to express green fluorescence protein only in neural stem cells. And if you remember, I told you that the neural stem cells are not found everywhere in the brain, but only in specific locations called the neurogenic niches, one of which is along the lateral ventricle and the other is in the subgranular zone of the dentate gyrus. Now, if I say that my mouse now is supposed to express green fluorescent protein only in stem cells, then you would intuitively expect green color only in these regions that are the neurogenic niches. And that's what you see in this uh, brain sections of a GFP, nesting GFP mouse, which shows neurogenic cells expressing green fluorescent protein along the wall of the lateral ventricle and in the hippocampus. So this is the lateral, the posterior ventricular wall showing neural stem cells. And this is the this is the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, again showing sparse neural cell population, neural stem cell population. And if I now zoom into the dentate gyrus, you can perhaps see it better. The green cells are the only cells that are stem cells, whereas the blue cells, which are thickly packed in this blue um, halo around these green cells called the dentate gyrus, are the mature granule neurons. And I hope you can appreciate that the presence, one thing that first the neural stem cells are only present in the first two cell layers of the dentate gyrus, and they are relatively far few in numbers when compared to the total number of cells in the dentate gyrus. Now through these kind of genetic, pharmacogenetic manipulations and cell molecular studies, we have learned a great deal about the process of neurogenesis, the various stages that a neural stem cell has to go through to become a neuron, a mature neuron in the adult brain. And this is a very simplistic cartoon of what goes on in hippocampal neurogenesis in the rodent brain. And uh, the first thing to show here is that the stem cell has a very characteristic morphology. It is also called a radial glia-like cell because it has a soma and a radial process that is shooting upwards without branching until the very end, which is where it has more branches. And this is a characteristic morphology of RGL, which is distinct from a mature neuron where branches start to shoot very proximal to the cell body. And now the stem cells of the adult brain actually are largely quiescent, meaning they live in a very inactivated state where they are just there, they're not making cells. 
Due to environmental stimulation or other reasons, any or many of these stem cells can get activated, making the activated radial glialide cell, which then can undergo process of division, either symmetric division or asymmetric division. In symmetric division, a radial glial cell can divide into two cells, one of which could be an astrocyte and the other could be a self-renewed stem cell. And this is how they make sure that the population or the pool of stem cell kind of renews because you, sh you saw in the last slide that the, to begin with, the number of stem cells are far few and very restricted in the region. So every time they proliferate or they divide, they try to make one of their own types so that the pool is maintained. The other type of division that can happen is, is a symmetric division in which the radial glial cells divides and make two radial glial cells. But the more dominant possibility of a cell division of a radial glial cell or a neural stem cell is an asymmetric division that is destined for neurogenic program. So in this asymmetric division, of course, it makes one of its own type radial glial cell and the other cell that it pr produces is a neural progenitor. It's also called an intermediate proliferating progenitor because the function of this cell is to just divide and amplify itself to make many more of these cells. And these proliferating cells at some point decide to take the fate of a neuron, at which point they're called neuroblasts. And these neuroblasts then gain various, undergo various cell molecular processes to, to the path of maturation to become a mature granule neuron that integrates into the circuit of the hippocampal circuit and contributes to hippocampal function. Now, one interesting thing about this process is that of the many cells, many immature neurons that are produced, only 25% or less actually make it to maturation and integration in the adult brain. So the question is why do we have such a wasteful process? Why make so many neurons to begin with when 75% or more are destined to die? Well, research has shown that this specific stage, which is the immature neuron stage, has different electrophysiological properties. And these specific properties actually have a functional role to play in the, in the normal cognitive functions and has uh, importance and that's an important part of the adult neurogenic function um, in a healthy brain. Uh, so we'll talk about the functions a little bit later, but now I want you to imagine that if you are a scientist and trying to look or quantify the number of newborn neurons that are born, how would you go about it? Because it's, the brain is full of neurons, right? That are embryonically born, some of which in some locations are new uh, adult born. How do you distinguish? essentially all of them will have a neuronal marker. So what you would look for is a stage prior. If you are able to identify an immature neuron, because each of these cell stages can be identified based on not just their structure, but also specific genes that are expressed only in restricted cell stages. For example, this gene is expressed only when the stem cell is activated and is about to proliferate, whereas this gene is only expressed in proliferating progenitors and double cotton, also known as DCX, is expressed only in immature stages of a newborn neuron. So these are some of the markers that are used to quantify neurogenesis. And this is an example of how we look at newborn neurons in the adult brain. Uh, again, blue stands for all the mature granule neurons that are thickly packed in this dentate gyrus region. And these red cells are the newborn neurons that are marked by the double cotton protein. And you can see they are fewer but abundant in the SGZ region of the hippocampus. So this is an example of good adult neurogenesis. And conversely, if you can, if you manipulate or the organism has gone through physiological situation that reduces neurogenesis, then it'll look something like this. Far fewer red cells, you can see the structure of the newborn neurons are also not good. So this would be an example of a poor adult neurogenesis, which can be qualitatively and quantitatively assessed. Now, good news, we know stem cells make new neurons in the adult brain, but why? Why are continually these new neurons mean? What are their functions? Now, a lot of this, a uh, lot of things we've learned initially was from songbirds. And uh, as many of you know, probably songbirds 
actually learn singing and sing their songs. I'd like you to hear a little bit of it. And I'd like you to pay notice that the the it's not general chirping. If you listen carefully, you will see that the syllables are on a loop. It is a song that it has learned and it repeats the exact same syllable in a rhythm. So I guess uh, I hope you can appreciate that there was a song being sung by the songbird. And what is known about songbirds is that they learn these songs before they attain sexual maturity, but use these songs to attract mates. And many of them continue to learn new songs during adulthood, which change from one year to the next. And what scientists noticed, and this was work that started around the time when new neurons were being discovered in the uh, in the adult brain of vertebrates, um, scientists found that the vocal, the high vocal centers, which were responsible for this singing, actually seasonally changed in volume in male songbirds. Uh, male are the songbirds which sing songs to attract mates. They also noticed that old neurons in this high vocal centers were being replaced by new neurons. And interestingly, learning of a new syllable was enabled by cell death mediated weakening in the motor control of the pre-existing syllable. In a way, the weakening of the old neuron was making way for a new neuron to be born and made and perhaps encode a new syllable. Another interesting thing was that it seemed like there was a correlation. They saw that cells that were born in the late summer or early fall and that presumably partake in song learning in that time were still around the next spring. And when when the and these songs that they had learned eight months earlier were being used during the breeding season. In contrast, half of the neurons that came upon in the HVC new neurons during the spring season did not last that long. They perished within the next four months. So this showed a correlation that the amount of singing had something to do with the presence and survival of the new neurons in the HVC. Not only that, they also noticed that not all neurons of the high vocal center were being replaced. They showed through experiment that only if they eliminated a specific type of neuron called the RA projecting cells, were these cells replaced by new neurons. In contrast, if they eliminated another cell type, which was another neuron type, which was an area X projecting cell, then these cells were not replaced. So these gave some very fun, this showed some very fundamental principles which correlated learning or neural action to the production of neurons and also iterated that this replacement or formation of new neurons is not generic but it is specialized and restricted. And these studies were then further confirmed in rodent models as well. In the 19, late 1990s, um, the groups had performed experiments in rodent model where they show that enhanced learning can actually enhance neurogenesis. And for this, they studied hippocampal neurogenesis and um, they tested two different tasks. One that was hippocampus dependent and one that was hippocampus independent. Now to give you an example, any or many tasks uh, can be encoded in our brain through different processes. For example, the task of navigation can be encoded or learned through a system called spatial navigation, which is dependent on hippocampal circuits. However, navigation can also be learned through cue training, which is trietal dependent and not hippocampus, de not hippocampus dependent. So to give you a little bit more clarity of what I mean by spatial learning, spatial learning is a process in which the information of the environment is encoded and that information is used through for navigation through the space. So this is uh, an example of spatial learning where uh, this is a big water tank 
and a mouse is released in this water tank. Mouse, mice, they are natural swimmers, so no danger. But nonetheless, they don't like water. Even if you leave them and they can swim, they would try to find a place where they can take a rest and get out of the water. And in the same tank, you could have a platform that is hidden beneath the level of the water and you can make the water opaque so that it cannot really see where the hidden platform is. And in the same uh, room, one could put spatial cubes like this square and a circle and a triangle and different parts of the wall that is in the visual parameter of the mouse. And you can give it several trials in which it can make a note of the spatial cues. And based on that, it can have a geographical map for the location of this platform. So after several trials, if you leave this mouse any part anywhere in the in the swimming tank, it would be readily able to find the platform by using the spatial cues which it has used to encode the location of this platform. So this form of navigation is called spatial learning. It's spatial learning based and is hippocampus dependent. But there is another way to do the same thing. If you had a tank and this platform on this platform, you put a red flag and through the trial session, the mouse would learn the association of this flag to the existence of this platform. And in this learning, it would not depend on any spatial cues. So it wouldn't matter whether you know this this box or anything else is there around. It would just look for the red flag and would know that is where the platform is. And this form of learning is called cue learning and it is hippocampus independent. It depends on circuits of the striatum. Now they in their experiment, they had the mice perform or learn uh, spatial navigation using either uh, spatial cues or through cue training and they showed that when spatial navigation was done that led to increased adult neurogenesis whereas if cue training was done there was no effect on neurogenesis so this showed that learning that used the hippocampal circuit activated the neurogenic niche of the hippocampus and resulted in increased neuron production in the adult brain another interesting um, observation that was made um, which has a great impact on the field is the fact that hippocampal neurogenesis actually responded to environment. And this was a very simple experiment done again in the late 90s where mouse were either kept in normal housing cage where there is bedding, food and water and they're just there versus they're kept in a cage where the lots of toys, a treadmill, a running wheel and other stuff is around so that and this is called an enriched environment for EE where the mice can not only live but also has play, um, and physical exercise, voluntary physical exercise. And they showed in this that mice that were in enriched environment had, had enhanced neurogenesis. And later on, a few years later, it was also shown that this was true for enhancing neurogenesis in uh, even in adult and older mice, that if they're put in isolation, the number of newborn neurons reduces dramatically. Whereas if they're put in enriched environment, and access to voluntary exercise, the neurons dramatically increase. So this led to the hypothesis that external perturbations, especially like exercise, which are non-invasive, can actually manipulate the production of neurons in your brain, which could have a direct impact in your cognitive capability. So new neurons are made in response to neural activity, we saw, and the stem cells in the brain respond to an organism's environment. So these two are fantastic, but the question is what happens after the neurons are born? What are their functions? So again, studies in rodents have uh, and uh, non-human primates as well have uh, given us a lot of information about what these new neurons might be doing in the brain. And one of the things um, that they have been implicated in is uh, the ability to pattern separate. Now the our ability to be able to differentiate between highly similar yet distinct objects or contexts depends on the hippocampal circuit and especially the dentate gyrus. And if you remember, this is the place of the brain, which is one of the neurogenic niches. And here you're seeing picture of two animals. One is a cat and one is a black panther sitting exactly in the same posture, looking very similar. But I'm very sure that most of you, in fact, all of you, must have been able to encode them as two different animals. 
And what it took for your brain to do that was to encode all the details. That means a lot of encoding. But at the same time, these encoding details had to be orthogonally separated. They could not be overlapped, meaning a same neuron could not be encoding two details that were very similar. So this ability to uh, encode in detail but keep them non-overlapping and separated is a specialized function of the dente gyrus, which is attained through a very careful balance between excitation and inhibition of the neurons. And this is the process which is influenced by the presence of the newborn neurons in their immature stage. And um, again, to give you a glimpse of how these, these, uh, this was learned uh, through rodent experiments is, um, and because this is mostly a student oriented talk, um, I, I'm going back to the experiments, giving a, a glimpse of how things are learned. Uh, and this is um, just in the generic sense, if you want to understand what a particular molecule, a gene, or even a biological process is doing, what's its functional role, then what would you like to do? Perhaps the one thing that you can do very straightforward is if you could just take that uh, process out or you could destroy it or block it and then look at what are the disturbances that are happening, then that gives you a very straightforward clue as to what the, the molecule or the process is important for in normal physiology. So exactly that is what was done. The neurogenic process was ablated to understand what it indeed was important for. So for this, um, X-ray radiation was used. This was also more than a decade back. Um, so why X-ray radiation? If you remember, the stem cells have to go through a process of proliferation, that is division of cells. And X-ray radiation, as many of you might know, has the property of producing DNA breaks. So it basically breaks the DNA and renders it um, impaired to produce new DNA. And so cell division is restricted. And if you restrict cell division, then you will restrict formation of new neurons for in this neurogenic niche. However, you want to do it in a very localized manner. So one could you know, cover the other parts of the brain and the body so that the X-ray radiation happens very locally and focally on the hippocampus. And by doing this, they were able to ensure that neurogenesis was the adult neurogenesis, adult hippocampal neurogenesis was indeed ablated. And then after doing this, they took the mice and subjected them for a complex spatial learning task that would have some hints of spatial that would make them to use the capacity of uh, pattern separation. So this experiment uh, consisted of a eight arm radial maze in which the mouse was first released in the start arm. And of all the eight arms, only one arm was open so it could go and take a look. However, 20 seconds later, it was again released in the same maze, but this time another arm was open where a food reward was kept. And through trial, various different trials, repeated trials, the mice learn that once it's um, once it's released into the into the choice um, uh, choice mode uh, in the radial arm, then it should avoid the first open arm, but go to the next one, next open arm. Only then it can get the food reward. And this is the kind of learning that would be useful for it during the test phase. In the test phase, the mice were then released in three different situations where the other open arm was either very closely located to the first arm or it was distantly located, in this case, in a separation of two other arms and in this case, in a separation of three other arms, distantly located. And it was, and, it, and the ability that was tested is whether the mouse was able to discern this extra open arm from the first open arm and how quickly was it able to do that. This experiment showed that mice that were depleted for adult neurogenesis could not distinguish between these two arms if they were located very close by. However, they were able to do so if the distance between these two arms were increasing. And in, an, in a collaborative experiment several years later, uh, it was also shown that if you could genetically manipulate to enhance adult neurogenesis, then you would help the pattern, pattern separation ability of an organism. So what about memory that can be erased? 
Now, this was an interesting observation that is also made and um, that implicates adult neurogenesis. As, as you would um, probably by now remember that hippocampus is one of the place where neurogenic adult neurogenic niche exists and new neurons are born. So in another hippocampus dependent task, which is a contextual pure memory. So in this task, what is done is that the context in which a mouse may experience an adverse stimuli. So in this case, this is a box in which there are these grids. And once the mouse enters the box, after giving it some time to encode the context that is recognize its environment, it's given a very mild foot shock through these grids. And that is the adverse stimuli. And as soon as that happens, its brain encodes or associates this context with the adverse stimuli. And once this association memory is formed, next time when the mouse is just brought in this context without any foot shock, it was able to recognize the context and get afraid by showing freezing response. And this freezing response is what can be quantified to know if it was able to first encode the memory and then recall it. Um, so this is called contextual fear conditioning. So firstly, what was tested was juvenile mice and adult mice were given this foot shock treatment and then brought into the context a day later, seven days later, two, two weeks later or a month later and seen if they still remember the context and freeze because of their fear memory. What they saw was that while the adult mice very robustly remembered their fearful experience and showed a freezing freezing response. The young mice did not do so. They had forgotten everything by two weeks and did not show any freezing response to the context. So this was interesting because it is already known that the juvenile brain, the postnatal developing brain, has far higher rate of postnatal neurogenesis compared to an adult brain. So this, what this could then suggest is that perhaps higher adult neurogenesis had something to do with the forgetting of uh, the context in the young mice. And this was very intriguing. So they tested this by taking the young, uh, the older mice, the adult mice, and this time after their fear, fear experience, fear context experience, one group was left just like that, whereas the other group was given running wheel, if you remember, Voluntary exercise increases adult neurogenesis. So they were giving this running wheel so that their adult neurogenesis increases after they have encoded the fear context memory. And then later on, they were tested for their freezing response. And what was seen was that mice that had enhanced adult neurogenesis had less freezing, meaning they forgot more. They forgot the fearful context. So this was very interesting because here earlier I showed you that adult neurogenesis was important for specific cognitive capabilities such as pattern separation. And now I'm telling you that in other contexts, fear memory, if you have higher adult neurogenesis, that actually erases your memory and makes your contextual memory poor. In this experiment, they further went on to prevent this enhanced neurogenesis by pharmacogenetic approaches and they could see a rescue in the freezing. So the question then is, why erase memory? Why have a process that instead of making memories or helping in formation of memory will actually erase memory? Well, some of you may guess that there might be some benefit because if there is only certain amount of hardware space in your brain, then to be able to encode new memories, maybe you want to get rid of some, you know, purge some of your memory. But more, um, evidence came from from further experimentation which showed that specifically in the context of hippocampal neurogenesis um, and its role in erasing memory that helped in the process of reversal learning. Now what is reversal learning? Reversal learning is a process in which pre-existing memories that are tied to a given context have to be erased in order to write a new memory for the same context. Now to simplify it a bit, I will go back to the water maze platform uh, experiment uh, where the task of the mouse was to find the location. And uh, let's say this is not the flag, this is just the platform and we are using spatial navigation. So the context is important really. 
And if in the same context, I ask the mouse to first learn this location for the platform, but then I change the location of this platform, but do not change the context. Now the mouse have to encode new memories or rewrite its memory of this context and place this platform in another location. So this is a very overlapping situation where the context hasn't changed, but the location of the platform has changed. And these are the kind of memory uh, where <clears throat> reversal learning is very important. That is to erase the previously acquired memory in relation to the context has to be erased for new memories to be successfully formed. And finally, um, the third angle in which adult hippocampal neurogenesis has been implicated is the emotional function of the brain. It has been shown that our ability to deal with stress is enhanced if adult neurogenesis, adult hippocampal neurogenesis are improved. And so these data have uh, come poured in over years in which human subjects were shown um, that hippocampal adult neural progenitors were reduced in cases of depression and that antidepressant treatment in major depressive disorder patients increased the number of adult neural stem cells in the dente gyrus of the hippocampus and also increased the volume of the dente gyrus. In rodents, people have shown that if rodents are subjected to environmental stressors such as prenatal stress or social defeat or early life stress or even administer glucocorticoid as a form of induced stress, then all of these things lead to impaired adult neurogenesis. Also, ablating adult neurogenesis has been shown to increase anxiety-like behavior, and increasing neurogenesis has been shown to improve recovery from acute stressors. So this shows that adult neurogenesis is good for mood and for our memory. However, other conditions where this nice physiological process is adversely impacted. And yes, indeed, like most other things, all good things um, have a vulnerability to be affected adversely, and so is adult neurogenesis. It has been shown that aging, which is normally not a pathological state, but is understood and has been seen to be a most significant risk factor for various cognitive decline and neurodegenerative disorder, is one physiological condition where adult neurogenesis dramatically reduces. It has been seen that the number of stem cells and proliferating progenitors decrease with aging. Also, hippocampus dependent cognitive capabilities. Also, these specific type of capabilities decline with age in human. And one such example will again be the switch from contextual to procedural learning. And we already spoke about it. So I'll go back to the same example. This is another form of spatial learning. This is called a Barnes maze, where on a circular table, you have several holes. And in one of these holes, there is a food reward and the mouse would be released on the center of the table and allowed to learn where the food reward is. And this mouse can either make use of this spatial clue, a triangle on the wall, um, to know where the location of this target is, to learn where the location of this target is, or it could take another approach to learn where the target is. Target is. And when they tested a young mouse versus an old mouse, they found that the strategies were different. Now to define the strategies in the beginning, when the mouse is left um, onto the center of the table, they will go randomly because they don't even know there is a food pallet. And they'll finally find that there is a food pallet at one particular location in the hole. But the other strategies is called the chaining strategies where a mouse can go hole by hole by hole by hole to find and finally learn where the location of this thing is, where it's able to find, or it can take help of the context, which is the spatial navigation form. And it was seen that when a young mouse was put in place, it almost always made use of spatial navigation capability using the context of the environment to correctly identify the location of the food reward hole. Whereas the older mice almost always used a procedural learning, that is the egocentric learning process uh, to find the um, target and this was correlated with the fact that allocentric learning which depends on hippocampus also um, which depends on hippocampus is at a location where neurogenesis declines with age whereas egocentric learning which makes use of striatal circuit is unaffected with age 
and in fact uh, well as you can understand that regardless of which strategy the mouse is using they were able to they will be able to find the reward and go to its place um, the only advantage the contextual learning gives is the flexibility if the food pellet is moved to another location the mice that has used spatial context to learn its location would be quicker to relearn or reverse the learn the position compared to the one that has used egocentric procedure to learn its location and again in another genetic trick um, this was uh, rather recent in which they found a way to genetically increase or enhance adult hippocampal neurogenesis by simply increasing the proliferation rate of the progenitors and they could do that in a in a time specific manner when they wanted it on when they wanted it off very neat genetic techniques and they were able to show that 4d mice which were the mice in which the progenitors were enhanced and the adult neurogenesis was enhanced the older 4d mice were able to use an allocentric technique and recognize the food reward center far quicker than the mice that only got the control treatment um, and used mostly procedural learning or egocentric learning to find its target. The other thing that is known to um, adversely affect the process of adult neurogenesis is inflammation. Um, it was shown that systemic inflammation, just like a bacterial inflammation uh, infection in your body, uh, could actually influence the stem cells sitting in your brain, resulting in reduction of adult neurogenesis. Furthermore, it was shown that this cell CNS or central nervous system extraneous source of inflammation that can influence adversely adult neurogenesis can actually be reversed. And this was again another neat experiment, which is called parabiosis, in which the, uh, the circulation, the blood circulation of the mice are um, are connected, physically connected. The, both the mice are alive. All you do is suture their skins together and the blood vessels grow uh, to connect the two mice blood circulation. And by doing so, what they were able to achieve was to circulate the young blood into the older animal system and vice versa. And what they showed was that in young mice, isochronic means they were connected to a similar kind, a younger mouse and heterochronic means they were connected to an older mice. And they saw that when young mice were connected to an heterochron uh, older mouse, then the amount of newborn neurons were reduced. Conversely, if an old mouse, in which the proliferating cells and the new newborn neurons were very few, these numbers actually increased when young mouse was attached to the old mouse and its circulation was shared into the old mouse circulation. Furthermore, they were able to show the same thing by infusing the young blood plasma into the old mouse and the old blood plasma into the young mouse through intraventral um, um, administration, intravenous administration, where you can see that the young plasma in the old brain um, could, uh, this is the young uh, brain neurogenesis with young plasma, but if you infuse now old plasma, plasma from an older brain into the young mouse, then amount of newborn neurons dramatically decreases. Now, so these, these are very important and interesting observation that even systemic information, we knew that uh, environment of the, of the organism affects neural stem cells in the brain, residing in the brain, but now we also see that the systemic uh, uh, milieu of the circulation can actually influence stem cells in the brain. Now, this is about the CNS extraneous influence. What if the inflammation source is inside the CNS? How is neurogenesis affected? And this would be contextual if you think about neurodegenerative disorders, which often come with neuroinflammation in the CNS. And very recently, uh, it was shown that uh, in the adult uh, human patients, uh, firstly, um, this was a detailed study, uh, much more thorough than all the previously existing uh, human studies um, in which it was first ascertained that new neurons or immature neurons can be in fact found in uh, human brains and uh, well up to the ninth decade of life. Uh, although the number of newborn neurons decline from anywhere between 
um, you know, after 40 years of age, they steadily decline, but you do see uh, plenty of newborn neurons in the adult brain going all the way up to the ninth decade. And furthermore, they showed that in patients that had various stages, patients of various stages of Alzheimer's disease, um, there was a reduction in newborn neurons. And most interestingly, uh, of these stages, uh, the BRAC stage one and two are stages where the senile plaques that are responsible for the neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease or that which are uh, detected are diagnostic marks of, adult, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, even before they, they are uh, formed, the number of newborn neurons actually dramatically goes down. And they even compared um, these uh, adult uh, the Alzheimer's disease samples with age matched normal uh, postmortem uh, brains and they showed that even though the neurogenesis decreased with age in normal patients for a same age group patient an Alzheimer's disease patient had even fewer number of new neuro newborn neurons and this is interesting if you think about the context first is that in Alzheimer's disease a lot of hippocampal dependent functions like memory and dementia is one of the um, uh, hallmark of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Many of the hippocampal dependent functions are deteriorated. And second, the hippo hippocampus is one of the uh, prominent region where neurodegeneration is seen in Alzheimer's disease. And what this study is revealing is that the neurogenesis, decline of neurogenesis actually precedes the uh, presentation of symptoms for Alzheimer's disease, which then tells you that it is possible that decrease in adult neurogenesis could be a causative as well. So in this context, one may want to think if the inflammation angle, which is known to reduce neurogenesis, could have a role to play in neurodegeneration as well. Now, what about regeneration? I'm sure that a lot of people who tuned into this talk tuned in because they were interested in neurodegeneration and a stem cell that can make neurons seems very lucrative for this whole topic of regeneration. So we have to talk about it a little bit. Now, in the context of uh, in the context of what we have just discussed about the uh, the bona fide neural stem cells of the adult brain, what we know is that first thing is that they are very restricted in their fate potential. They don't make all types of neuron. They are coded to make specific types of neuron. The second thing we learned is that they are only located in specific locations. One that is in the hippocampus, another in the lateral ventricle walls. So for neurodegenerative disorders that are happening elsewhere, such as Parkinson's happening in striatum, it would be a real challenge for first these stem cells to be available in that part of the brain and then to be able to make neurons that are dopaminergic, the neuron type that is affected in that particular neurodegenerative disease. Now, it doesn't, it cannot, one cannot say that is unachievable because we are still learning more about these stem cells. And as we go on identifying molecular regulators that can manipulate the fate plasticity of these cells and also alter the locations, that has to do with the migration of these cells perhaps or integration into another circuit. These are the type of information that we need to know to be rightly able to use the endogenous stem cells residing in the adult brain for regenerative purposes. However, it's not all sad story because there are ample evidence of progenitor potential of other parenchymal cells, other cells in the brain that can be induced to make neurons. So this is one of my concluding slides, giving hope for all regeneration enthusiasts beyond the existing adult stem cells in the brain, which is that it has been shown that in the normal healthy brain, there are these cells called astrocytes and there are cells called ependymal cells, which kind of line the ventricular wall. These cells are normally kept quiescent, meaning in their ependymal state or astrostatic state, um, through various cell signaling processes. However, it has been shown that in the context of stroke and other type of injury, this quiescent stage or the signaling that keeps these cells inactivated is broken and they in fact are released from quiescence to make cells that can become neuroblasts that can go on to uh, give rise to neurons. 
So this is um, an example where the endogenous cells can be invoked in ways uh, to make neurons for the purpose of perhaps regeneration. The other hope is transplantation. Embryonic stem cells or stem cells that can be derived from skin cells, let's say, can be made into neural stem cells and then can be implanted into the, uh, into the brain at the region where neurodegeneration is happening to make to uh, to enable neurons of that kind to be formed and be integrated and some of very preliminary studies in model organisms have shown that that might indeed be possible in the environment of a degenerative um, or a or a lesion brain where stem cells implants have been shown to be actually differentiated into neurons and be able to connect to the circuit However, these are very early studies and this is a long way to go because the task is not just to make a cell type differentiate and become a neuron, but you have to understand that the adult brain is very different from a growing brain. All the circuits are made and there's hardly any space. And if you make a new neuron, it's not just about making the cell, but it is more about that cell being able to make synaptic connections to the right circuits and the right cells to be able to impart its function. So this is a complicated process and the journey has begun, but it seems very optimistic, be it for implanted or spontaneous invoke, uh, invoked neurogenesis uh, in the context of neurogenesis. However, going back to the, the bona fide adult neural stem cells, uh, the bare uh, fact that these stem cells make these specialized neurons which have very specific function that enhance our capability of cognition and emotional resilience is a very exciting news. And to top that, the fact that these um, actually respond to the environment makes them a very um, a, a good target for therapeutic use um, because non-invasive procedures can actually um, make an impact in mood and memory disorders. Uh, and also through transplantation and regeneration goal, if we understand more about the character of the stem cell and the regulators, how they can be instructed to become one or the other, how are the environmental cues mediated to these cell types to behave a certain way, and what are the, what is the full repertoire of its responses? Does it only make neuron and glial cells, or are there other detrimental, possibly detrimental uh, potential of these stem cells? The holistic information about these cell type would lead us to better usage of uh, their therapeutic promise. So with this, I think I will conclude my talk. Thank you all for uh, listening in. This is uh, my research group um, at NCBS. And if any of you are interested in neuroscience, um, feel free to connect and join us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such a wonderful talk, ma'am. And we are getting so many questions even from uh, the YouTube and also some people are texting me personally from the WhatsApp webinar groups. Sure. So, OK, the first question I got is uh, from uh, Suad Kadim Khan and mm -hmm. she want to know, do a growing child or an adult have a large number of NSC? OK, so yeah, so like I said, uh, when we were talking about the juvenile mice experiment, right? The growing child has far more number of neural stem cells and neural proliferating cells uh, compared to even a teenager. OK, ma'am. Uh, and uh, other question, she also asked another question but that is, what are the ethical issues associated with NSC or similar to embryonic stem cells? Do they possess any ethical issues similarly? Well, the ethical issues are most uh, most uh, consequential when you're talking about research in human or human cells. A lot of these studies are done in rodents uh, where you take animal ethical clearance. You have to get that as well. Um, as uh, far as uh, transplantation is considered, uh, all of the those have an so basically if you are talking about whether you can get ethical one can get ethical clearances to utilize uh, the the uh, the existing information to, uh, to to further research and understand better yes there are processes in place in which 
uh, through which you can get ethical clearances and get these experiments done. But if you are talking about ethical uh, issues related to making a monster, then that's a uh, that's a different question. And here we are talking only about a restrictive potential um, of uh, say embryonic stem cell, and that is to make a certain type of neuron, not an organism, right? So it's 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 slightly different than making or cloning um, uh, an organism altogether. Okay, ma'am. The and another question. Uh, this is this one. I was actually waiting for. <laughs> actually, we got a few many questions the similar way. Um, many times uh, we might have heard that we use only ten percentage of our brain. Is that true? What does that even mean in the first place? Yeah, I like the second part of the question. What does it even mean in the first place, right? Um, I think if you are to talk at a very you know cell molecular anatomical level then what it probably means is that you know that neurons are very complicated in structure right a cell has many projections shooting out and each of these protection projection makes thousands of connections synapses to another cell another neuron and even to glia right uh, now a lot of these uh, connections are physically there but they are not functionally there they're not functionally activated one thing that is known about neurons is that until a signal is processed through them and processed enough number of time, the connections are not functionally realized. They are not functionally activated. So when, when people say that if you do diverse amount of things, the more you engage your brain, the more active it would be, it actually is real because the more you're engaging, the more signals are passing through your neurons and the more signals the pass, uh, and more circuits that it is engaging, more synaptic connections are becoming fun functional, right? And that is how you could possibly activate more percentage of your neural circuits than there are physically. Okay, ma'am. The previous question was from Vivek, and this question is from Abin Steve Matthew. He is asking, is mind a real thing? Then what is meant by a subconscious mind? Wow, that's a deep question. It's a philosophical question. Um, well, subconscious mind, very technically, subconscious mind is when you're not in your conscious, maybe when you're in deep sleep. And there are a lot of things happening in the brain when you're in the deep sleep. And a lot of it has to do with how your cognitive processes, your memories and your cognitive abilities develop. So this is a well-studied subject uh, in which people are trying to understand when we are not conscious, meaning so conscious could be that you're totally knocked off, right? You don't even, you know, cannot even feel anything, or it could mean that you are in sleep, in deep sleep, but you can be awakened. Uh, in either of these stages, it's not that the brain shuts down. It's not that the neural circuits, all of them kind of go to rest. That's not what happens. Actually, that is a very active process of the brain where consolidation of memory happens that allows us better cognition when we are conscious. Um, so this is this would be one way to uh, say what is a subconscious brain is um, thinking about mind. Um, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, so probably it's a wrong question for me. I definitely think that uh, the mind is real and it consists of uh, the anatomy and the neurochemical uh, reactions that are going on inside our brain. Okay, ma'am. Uh, and the other question is from Pranav Raj. Ma'am, is that habit cycle connected with the neurons? If connected, what happens if we start that habit? 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 Yeah, 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 yeah ma'am. Okay. So habits are actually, uh, they are a product of your memory, your learning and your memory. And then something to do with a little bit of a reward cycle perhaps and it definitely is a process anything that is neural in nature that is instructed by neurons can be trained and retrained so if you are trying to um, ask whether habits can be changed yes they can be um, uh, changed it you know by more or more rigorous or less rigorous processes but Given that it is a process that is governed by neural functions, um, 
any cellular functions can be actually trained um, as so far as neuronal training is concerned. Yes. OK, ma'am, uh, the other question uh, is the first question I got uh, in this webinar and the similar question is also there in the YouTube. OK, ma'am, uh, I think all of them want to uh, grow a new brain and want to replace their brain with that. Can we grow a new brain Oops. if possible? Can we make the duplicate of our brain and replace the current brain by transplantation? And another question and another question, the similar question I found in YouTube is like um, what uh, ma'am how far we are from creating an artificial functioning human brain do you think it is possible in near future by fatima k near future no maybe not but in the future nothing is impossible right what i can tell you the current state of affair is that there are things called organoids and that are being uh, realized for not just the brain but for any other organ in the brain what they are trying to do is create a three-dimensional structure in which stem cells could be put in and allowed given growth factors to differentiate into the cell types of that organ for example the brain consists of neurons astrocytes oligodendrocytes ependymal cells microglia vasculature all of that it's a very lofty task as you can imagine uh, you can take a cell and make it to become neuron and then you can put it in a three dimensional structure so it entangles and make a lot of uh, you know more circuit looking like thing that is one thing but that's not brain because brain has to have all these other cell types along with the bus vasculature if you are to make an artificial brain but the efforts are on and these are called organoids uh, maybe you can look up and read up more about brain organoids um, a, a lot of success has happened in being able to grow not just neurons but other supporting cells and vasculature um, in brain organoids. And uh, as we go about it, if not anything else, these will these are actually being grown. And right now, the 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 goal with it is to be able to create model for studying human brain and functions and disorders and so forth. Um, now that brings me to the question, the first question, which was about replacement of brain. I wish this was a more interactive platform. If I were to ask you guys how. Why do you think brain may not be a replaceable entity? Um, one could argue that unlike other cells, the way brain works is through encoding and consolidation of information. Right. And um, at this stage um, and, and these things, the encoding and consolidation of these information happen through experiences. An organism hears something, sees something, smells something, feels something. And these are the information that are firing the neurons of a certain circuit in a certain way and creating or encoding those experiences in a certain way. Even if you create the cells, even if you make the physical connection, unless the same environmental situation is recreated so that the same exact firing is happening in exact similar way in the neural circuits, you cannot possibly replace the existing brain. OK, thank you, ma'am. And we have three more last three more questions, ma'am. Sure. OK, uh, this question is very interesting because someone want to erase her painful memories. Can we isolate and manipulate the cell which holds memory of painful past events and create new beautiful memories. Wonderful, right? That would be such a wonderful thing to be able to do. The first thing is that erasing memory is totally possible and I gave you an example of how hippocampal neurogenesis actually plays a role in erasing memory and that how that helps cognitively uh, cognitively uh, an organism's uh, survival and uh, um, and acquisition of reversal memory. Um, in terms of manipulation, you know, there are um, the newest in the art is the are the optogenetic techniques uh, which can allow to manipulate single neurons in a live animal by just shining light on the neurons of a specific these are again genetic manipulation pharmacogenetic manipulations and um, through through these processes i mean as as you as i mean if you're talking about humans and they, these have to you know go through various processes of development and um, 
you know, you know that neural circuits are st can be stimulated in human and is done in very many neuro neurodegenerative disorders. So, so long as you can manipulate neurons and you keep finding out which circuit and how a particular experience is encoded, there is a possibility that you can manipulate then that particular neuron in that particular cir circuit to modulate the memory that has been formed already. So yes, the possibility is there. Okay, well, the second last question is from Adarsha Eche, and his question is, man, what do you think about our Penrose um, orchestrated objective reduction hypothesis for the heart problems of consciousness? Or what is the most popular solution for the hard problem of consciousness? Whoa, I don't know what is the hard problem of consciousness. Can you define it? Uh, I think he uh, is not available in the YouTube. I mean, so I think again, like I said, I was talking to Arun before. Hard is again is a relative term, right? What is what you're trying to describe by a hard problem of consciousness? Uh, is actually a subjective matter. And uh, so long as understanding consciousness is concerned, yes, the whole neuroscience community is in and, and beyond that are very interested to understand consciousness. There are many ways to kind of reconcile with what you make of consciousness, conscience, consciousness. Um, and, um, and neuroscience is one way. Um, that's the way scientists want to decipher and understand it. And going by it, the more you understand um, about how uh, the circuits um, work, how various uh, situations, uh, experiences, emotions, and memory are coded, encoded, erased, um, man can be manipulated um, through external and internal uh, changes that are happening. But the more you learn about how how these things work, and maybe those are the information that can provide you a little zoomed out picture to understand what consciousness is um, and perhaps being able to understand if there is a problem with it at all. OK, ma'am. OK, ma'am. And the last question um, is uh, human brain size has evolved to be bigger compared to the past. Is that an advantage to our intelligence? If so, why aren't animals like elephant and whales more intelligent than us as they have larger brains than humans. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, so I had muted myself because there was a loud train going there. Oh, but, OK, ma'am. Uh, yeah, uh, so yes, uh, definitely the larger area of the brain is a definite advantage to uh, human beings being more um, intelligent species. Um, and even though our brain do not look as big as the brain of an elephant, it probably has a huge uh, surface area. If you if you uh, see any image of the brain, human brain, it has a lot of sulci. Um, that means a lot of folds in the neocortex that increases the area of the surface area of the brain where neurons can be embedded and uh, can have their processes and interact with them and that definitely has um, advantage in, in terms of how much can be encode um, and learn. Um, and I, I believe that uh, that is that is what gives us a bigger advantage compared to other larger vertebrates which might have bigger looking brain but uh, may not necessarily have uh, um, similar surface area ratio to the body. OK, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I got a question from a sixth grade boy. I mean, he's a student, so. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> the sixth grade boy is attending this talk. That's amazing. Yeah, his name is Arjun Suraj. Mm -hmm. uh, and his question is, um, I have a question, ma'am. A few thousands of years ago, um, there are no internet, no calculators or anything. Uh, they made many discoveries, but uh, today with the technology, uh, still rate of discovery is uh, less. Why, ma'am? Discovery is less? Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> no, it's thing, uh, rate of discovery is lower than before, something like that. Um, I, I completely disagree with that. 
I think that the rate of discovery is much higher. Also, the quality of discoveries, and I'm talking about biological sciences in particular. So it is true that physics and maths uh, have uh, have gone on full speed even before the technology was available. Computers were available, and fundamental principles have been deciphered and you know instated uh, long back. Uh, but that has not been the case with biology. The biology and the, the cell are very, very complicated. And without the help of technology, it was only possible uh, to discover so much. And it is, in fact, uh, amazing how I talked about uh, Kahal in one of my slides. And this was hundreds of years ago, where uh, just by looking at um, the anatomy of the brain or the structures of the cell, uh, Ramani Kohal was able to distinguish between glial cells of different type and neuronal cells that were different types and were able to predict a lot of things that came out to be true later on through experimentation. However, a lot of the lot of his uh, predictions or predictions from other scientists who did not have the technology to go look inside into the cell and in the genome and the expression of proteins and genes, um, some of them actually did not turn out to be true. So while you know we had made huge advances in medical science and in understanding biology, proving many of those predictions or many of those hypotheses or thinking have only started to happen in the 19th century, where uh, in the 20th century, where with the help of the technology, we are able to look deep um, and broad and understand uh, biology in a zoomed out and um, zoomed in perspective at the same time. Thank you, ma'am. We are also very happy to have you, ma'am, because uh, even though we conducted uh, previous webinars for astronomy, the people were curious to know about the black holes and um, the questions were also very common and from the common people. So it was very interesting also from your explanation also. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And I'm handing over the session to uh, our senior board member, Gautam Krishna. Thank you, Arun. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Hi. I, on the behalf of Shafs of Negi and the entire team working behind each event, extend a very hearty thanks to today's speaker, Dr. Kia Ghosh, for sharing her expertise and opinions with us and giving us an opportunity to learn something new. Thank you, ma'am. I would also like to thank our mentor, Dr. Anand Narayanan, for this constant support. I also extend my sincere thanks to all our members and viewers for joining in us with today. Had a great evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. It was exciting to be part of this effort. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye. Stop.